How to survive a citywide blackout in winter when the grid is dead, the streets are frozen tombs, and your furnace is just expensive scrap metal. The power grid just collapsed under the weight of a polar vortex that turned your city into a frozen graveyard. No warning, no backup, just the sound of your furnace dying mid-breath and the lights flickering out like hope itself. Outside, the temperature is dropping faster than your phone's battery, which is also dead, by the way. Inside, your modern heated palace is about to become a walk-in freezer with furniture. The pipes will freeze, the food will rot or freeze solid. And hypothermia? That's not a threat for tomorrow. That's a threat for tonight. Every winter, blackouts kill people. Not from starvation, not from looters, from the cold. And from the stupid things desperate people do to fight it like firing up a gas oven indoors or running a generator in the garage until the carbon monoxide turns their brain into soup. No worries, we're surviving this blackout with science, scraps, and a little bit of controlled chaos. Step one, pick your fortress and seal it like a tomb. You don't heat a whole house when the power's dead. That's a fantasy. You heat one room, one small defensible heat trapping box where you and your people will huddle like refugees in a bunker. Find the smallest room in your house with the fewest windows. A bathroom, a closet, a windowless bedroom. Doesn't matter if it's pretty, matters if it's small. Small rooms trap heat, big rooms eat it. Now seal it. Stuff towels, blankets, old clothes, duct tape, garbage bags, anything under the door and around the window frames. You're not trying to make it airtight. You're trying to stop the cold from crawling in like a predator. Every crack is a leak. Every leak is degrees lost. If you have plastic sheeting or even trash bags, tape them over the windows. It's ugly, it's ghetto, it works. You've just made a primitive thermal shelter inside your own home. Congrats, you're now a cave dweller with a mortgage. Step two, insulate your body like it's the only heater you've got, because it is. Your body is a furnace. Your 98.6 degree biological reactor that burns calories and pumps out heat but it's also leaking that heat constantly through your skin, your head, your hands, your feet, everywhere. So you'll layer up. Not one thick coat, layers. Thin, loose layers trap air between them, and air is an insulator. Wear a base layer, long underwear, thermal shirt, whatever. Then a middle layer, fleece, hoodie, wool sweater. Then an outer layer, jacket, blanket, sleeping bag. Put on a hat. A huge chunk of your body heat escapes through your skull because your brain is a calorie-guzzling furnace and your head has no fat. Wear gloves. Wear two pairs of socks. Wool is king. Cotton is a death sentence when it gets wet. If you don't have enough clothes, wrap yourself in blankets, towels, curtains, old coats from the closet. Look ridiculous. Stay alive. And here's the science. Your body loses heat through conduction, touching cold things. Convection, cold air moving past you, radiation, heat radiating out into space like a sad little star, and evaporation, sweat. Layers stop convection and radiation. Staying dry stops evaporation. Sitting on something insulated, a yoga mat, cardboard, a pile of clothes, stops conduction from the frozen floor. You're not just wearing clothes. You're building a portable microclimate. Let's talk heat, the safe kind not the kind that'll kill you in your sleep. And let's get this out of the way right now. Do not use your gas stove or oven to heat your room. I don't care how cold it is. I don't care if your neighbor is doing it. Gas appliances pump out carbon monoxide, an odorless, colorless gas that shuts down your brain and stops your heart while you're just sitting there, thinking you're getting a little sleepy. The same goes for charcoal grills, propane camp stoves, and especially generators running indoors or even in the garage. These aren't heaters, they're suicide machines. Every single year, blackouts turn into body counts because someone thinks just for a little while won't kill them. It does. So what do you use? Option one, body heat. Huddle up, I'm serious. Get your family, your pets, your weird uncle, everyone into that one sealed room and pile under every blanket you own or get into sleeping bags. Shared body heat is free, it's completely safe, and it is shockingly effective. Humans are walking, talking 98-degree space heaters. Use them. Option two, 
safe indoor heaters. If you prepped ahead of time, you have an indoor rated propane or kerosene heater. The key words there are indoor rated, and you still need proper ventilation. Crack a window about an inch, run it in short bursts to take the edge off, and never ever sleep with it on. These heaters are designed for this situation, but they still produce combustion gases. Respect them or they will hurt you. Option 3. Hot water bottles. Boil water on a camp stove outside or on a small indoor safe burner. Pour it carefully into bottles. Now jeans, old soda bottles, anything that can handle the heat. Wrap them in towels so you don't get burned. Stick them in your sleeping bag or under your blankets. You've just created an instant portable heat source that lasts for hours. Option 4. Candles. A few candles in a small sealed room can raise the temperature a couple of degrees. It's not much, but in a real survival scenario, 2 degrees is the difference between shivering all night and actually getting some sleep. Use sturdy candles in safe holders, and do not leave them unattended. A fire during a blackout is a death sentence. The science here is simple. Heat is energy. Your body makes it. Heaters make it. Candles make it. The goal is to trap that energy in one small room and stop it from leaking out. Insulation plus a heat source plus a sealed space, that equals survival. You won't be warm doing this, but you won't die. And right now, that is the only bar that matters. Now for step four, water. Because frozen pipes are a catastrophe you can absolutely prevent. When the heat dies, a countdown starts on your plumbing. When water freezes, it expands, and when it expands inside a metal pipe, the pipe explodes. You will come back to a flooded, destroyed house when the power finally clicks back on. So, you drip. Go to every faucet in your house and open it to a slow, steady drip, just a pencil-thin stream. Moving water doesn't freeze nearly as fast. This isn't a guarantee, but it buys you precious time. If you have pipes in the basement, garage, or a crawl space, wrap them. Use towels, old clothes, foam insulation, anything. Even newspaper works. You're just trying to slow the cold down. Now for let's talk drinking water. Your hot water heater is holding 40 to 60 gallons of perfectly drinkable water. That's your emergency reserve. To get it, turn off the power or gas to the heater, let it cool down, then open the drain valve at the bottom. Boom! Gallons of clean water. You should also have water stored, a gallon per person per day minimum. If you don't, the second the power goes out, fill your bathtub, your sinks, every pot and bucket you have. City water pressure can fail fast. And if you run out and need to melt snow, do it outside on a camp stove. Only bring it inside after it's melted. Melting snow indoors adds a ton of moisture to the air, which makes the cold feel so much worse and leads to condensation and mold. The science? Water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Moving it and insulating the pipes slows that process. And remember, your body needs water to generate its own heat. Dehydration literally makes you colder. This isn't about being comfortable. It's about a checklist for staying alive. Heat, water. You handle these two things right, and you'll walk out of this just fine. That's how you win. All right, let's keep this going. Step five, food. The mantra here is simple. Eat like a scavenger, think like a strategist. Your fridge is dying, your freezer's dying, but listen close, they are not dead yet. This is a race against the clock. A full freezer gives you about 48 hours if you keep that door shut. Half full, you've got 24 hours, tops. Your fridge, it's just a glorified cooler now. You've got maybe a day, so you prioritize. You hit the fridge first, the leftovers, the milk, anything that spoils fast. That's round one. Then you move to the freezer. Now here's a pro move. If it's below freezing outside, you just recruited a new appliance. Move your frozen food into a cooler or a secure box. Congratulations, your backyard is now a walk-in freezer. Just make damn sure no animals can get to it. Once you've worked through all that, you're on to the non-perishables. This is your long-haul supply. Canned food, pasta, rice, peanut butter, protein bars, anything that can sit on a shelf and not complain. If you need to cook, you take it outside, use a camp stove, or if you have an indoor safe burner, crack a window for ventilation. Do not turn on your gas stove to heat the house or for long cooking sessions. That's how you get a one-way ticket with carbon monoxide. Here's the science. Your body is a furnace. In the cold, it burns more calories just to keep you from turning into an ice sculpture. So you need to eat more. 
High-calorie, high-fat foods are your best friends. Nuts, chocolate, peanut butter, this is dense fuel for your internal engine. Next, step six, light, because darkness is dangerous. Power's out, lights are out, and stumbling around in the pitch black is how you trip, break an ankle, or knock over a candle and watch your whole survival plan go up in smoke. So you light it up. Flashlights, headlamps, battery-powered lanterns, hell, even glow sticks, use them. To make your batteries last, here's a strategy. Use candles when you're sitting still and save the flashlights for when you're on the move. But what if you're desperate? You got no batteries, one candle left. Look in your kitchen cabinet. You can make a lamp. Find a small glass jar or a metal can. Fill it halfway with cooking oil. Any kind will do. Now find a wick, a strip of an old cotton t-shirt, even a shoelace. Twist it tight, soak it in the oil, and leave about an inch sticking out. Light it. You now have a lamp that will burn for hours. It's primitive science. The oil is the fuel. The wick uses capillary action. It literally drinks the oil up to the flame, feeding it. It's ancient technology. And it works. Step seven, communication, because isolation kills hope faster than the cold. Your phone is a paperweight. The cell towers are down. The internet is a distant memory. You're cut off. If you prepped, you're reaching for your hand crank emergency radio right now. You're tuning into local stations, getting updates on the blackout, finding out where warming shelters are. If you didn't prep, you're in conservation mode. Your phone is for emergencies only. Turn off Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, kill all the apps. Squeeze every last minute out of that battery. Your car charger can give you a boost, but only run the car in short bursts and never, ever in a closed garage. But the most important communication tool you have isn't electronic. It's your own two feet. Go check on your neighbors. Knock on doors. Especially the elderly or people with disabilities. Share what you have. Share information. In a blackout, your community is your lifeline. Survival is a team sport. And then, it happens. A flicker. The low hum of the grid returning. The furnace roars back to life. You made it. That sealed room, the layers of clothes, the dripping faucets, the scavenged food. It all worked. You didn't panic. You didn't poison yourself. You didn't freeze. You stared down a citywide blackout in the dead of winter and won, using nothing but scraps, science, and a solid plan. There was no high-tech bunker, no prepper fantasy. It was just you and the knowledge that when the systems we rely on die, you don't have to. You survived. And if the furnace doesn't come back on, you know what to do. You have the skills now. You have the plan. Welcome to the new world where survival isn't about fighting zombies, it's about fighting the cold and winning.